Hey, everybody, and welcome back. I'm Amelia Thompson, your host of the Worth Electronic Webinars with our exclusive sponsor, DigiKey Electronics. Today's webinar we are bringing back after our summer vacation is the Symphony of Oscillators, Harmonizing Signals for Success. Of course, partnered with DigiKey Electronic and presented with Worth Electronics' own Susanna Engel Rodriguez. She's a field application engineer for the crystals and oscillators division here at Worth Electronic. Now, if you have any questions during today's webinar, feel free to ask them in the questions box and we will get to them a little bit later uh, after today's session. And if we don't get those answered or maybe we need to go a little bit more into detail, be sure you follow up with our follow-up email, webinar team at we-online.com. We will make sure to get your questions answered. Now, because you registered for today's webinar, you will automatically receive a follow-up email, of course, from webinar team at we-online.com. And that will include a recorded video of today's presentation along with a PDF of the slides. And now I'm going to hand it over to Su Susanna as she presents Worth Electronics Symphony of Oscillators Harmonizing Signals for Success, partnered with DigiKey Electronics. Thanks a lot, Amelia. Hello, also from my side. Uh, thanks a lot for registering uh, for that seminar today. Um, um, during the presentation, I'm going to um, take off my camera um, simply to ensure we do have a good internet um, connection and I will be back with my camera when we come to the um, question part of the presentation. So let's get started with the symphony of oscillators. Let's have a quick look at our uh, today's agenda. So first of all, I'm going to start with a short introduction. And afterwards, we will directly dive into the topic about the types of noises that could occur when using an oscillator and going for an EMC measurement. Um, there we do have usually three kinds of noises, noises from the oscillator itself, from the power line, and also on the output line from the oscillator to the microcontroller. We will look at all kinds of noises and what you can do um, during your design phase to um, reduce or even eliminate all kinds of noises and have uh, no problems at the EMC measurement later on. At the end, we will also have a look at the PCB layout recommendations because the best filtering can't do magic if the PCB layout is not very good. So let's get started with a short introduction. So first of all, what is EMI and EMC? Of course, the most of you know it, it's electromagnetic interference and electromagnetic compatibility. But what does that mean? Um, so in general, when we now look around, we can see that there is more and more number of electronic devices all around us. Um, especially since Corona, the number uh, of electronic devices even more increased. And we need to make sure that all these kind of electronic devices do not disturb each other. And that is what the EMC um, regulations are for. So we need to ensure that there are specific regulations in place to limit the emissions and interferences um, devices are um, yeah, getting out um, so that we don't disturb other parts. And also we need to ensure that our electronic device is not interrupted by any other device. I think uh, we all still can remember the times when we heard a mobile phone already ringing before it was actually ringing in the radio because we heard it did it did it did it did it. That was a um, typical case of interference that we don't want to see and hear anymore nowadays. But what does that mean in respect of oscillators? Oscillators are in many, many cases, the heartbeat of a circuit. Without the clock of an oscillator, uh, many functions won't work as they do at the moment. And um, they are 
as said, the heart to the microcontroller, which is usually the brain of a um, circuit. And to protect our heart of the circuit, um, correct, we need to make sure that we also have some measurements in place. Um, because, yeah, oscillators can be affected by EMIs or by, by interferences, but also, on the other hand, they could generate interferences. And of course, we need to ensure that this doesn't happen. And in general, yeah, we need to um, take appropriate measures um, to uh, prevent any interference to get out. And how this could look like, we will see in the following slides and talk about. So now let's directly start with the oscillator and the type of noises. As mentioned in the beginning, there are in general three kinds of noises we see around the oscillator. On the one side, it's from the power line that comes to the oscillator. It can be from the oscillator itself, or it could be the output line that um, builds up some interference um, for the circuit. We are going to look at all three of them and in detail, and we'll start with the noise from the oscillator. In general, First of all, I want to say that presentation and all of the recommendations are mainly for um, crystal-based oscillators. Um, that is what I have been looking at and that's what my um, experience is with. Uh, so if you are using a MEMS oscillator, it might not be 100% applicable. Um, so please be aware of that. When we look at the oscillator, the oscillator itself is seldom a problem. Uh, usually it's the um, noise from the input line or from the output line that causes all, any kind of noise. However, um, the IC within the oscillator or also the connection from the IC to the crystal plank within the oscillator could lead to a little bit of interferences. However, there is some things we could, um, um, missing the English word, sorry for that, that we could, um, I will rephrase my sentence, sorry for that. Uh, so there is some uh, things that we can um, change or yeah, do with the choice of specific parameters when we choose an oscillator already that have an influence on the EMI. And that is the first thing we want to look about. So what can we do with the choice of oscillator that um, influences the EMI? First of all, it's already the type of oscillator. Usually, most of the time, the type of oscillator will be already um, yeah, made by the overall um, application that we are looking. Like for example, an 060, we wouldn't use um, if we don't need it. So if you have, for example, a very stable um, application you are looking for, then you might use an oscillator, an uh, 060, so an oven controlled um, crystal oscillator. However, an oven controlled crystal oscillator, O6O, is very good when it comes to EMI because usually O6O is using very high quality components and already has a very good um, layout, very low phase noise within the circuit. And therefore, the emissions are uh, pretty low when it comes to EMI. On the other hand, a V6O has a controlled voltage. So that's what it stands for, a voltage controlled crystal oscillator. And whenever you have the chance to change something, um, with the change of, uh, uh, of a voltage, then it is also uh, susceptible of interferences and uh, it's not so good for EMI issues. The same is for T6Os. Within a temperature controlled crystal oscillator, you do have um, um, a compensation circuit. And again, there you adjust the frequency with the temperature from outside. So it is susceptible um, for variations and may introduce noise to your circuit. Uh, 
On the other hand, a standard XL is, a, is quite a good compromise. It doesn't have the high quality components from an OCXO, but on the other hand, it also doesn't have um, any um, control circuit or um, compensation circuit. The next parameter we could influence the EMI is with the size. Usually we often say bigger is better, but in that case, we have to say smaller is better um, because simply larger parts mean longer traces and larger antennas, so they make more efficient radiators. Um, additional, they uh, probably bring more parasitic elements like inductance or capacitance or re re resistance to your, um, to your circuit. Um, therefore, smaller is better when it comes to the size of oscillators within your circuit. The next point, we look at is the output signal. Of course, this is usually given by the um, microcontroller you are using. Um, but just keep in mind, if you are using um, a rectangle um, or square wave output like CMOS, of course, it's usually the most easiest one for the microcontroller to use. But on the other hand, the square wave output is done by um, adding a lot of uh, harmonic frequencies to get to that uh, square wave. And therefore, you will also have a lot of harmonics within your um, EMI spectrum or EMC spectrum. The next one, sine wave, is when it comes to EMC, the best one, because it's a single clear um, frequency that comes out of your oscillator. Um, on the other hand, it is very sensitive, so especially to um, interferences from outside. So you must, must take very good care on a sine wave signal if you use it. A differential output, like for example, LVPACL or LVDS, is usually very good if it is designed properly on your um, layout. So it means um, both differential lines must be at the same length and close to each other, then it is pretty good for EMC uh, considerations. Next point we can have a look at is the rise and fall time. And here we can say, take it slow. The slower, the better. Um, it simply influences the harmonics and spectral content and edges of the output. So if we have faster rise and fall times, we will see um, also um, yeah, sharper um, edges and more frequency, high frequency spectral uh, content. Um, therefore, if you can use a slower oscillator, go for it. And one point I want to mention here is if you um, have a look into the data sheet of an oscillator. There's usually a number for the rise and fall time. And I would say in most cases, don't believe that uh, because usually um, oscillators are much faster than it is um, updated in the data sheet. So if it's of importance for you, um, go ahead and ask your oscillator supplier for some measurements um, to know the real number for the rise and fall time. Frequency, so the, the most defining parameter for oscillators. Again, here we can say lower is better, just because higher frequencies um, make smaller antennas. So um, yeah, the um, perfect antenna length is depending on the frequency. And um, it's more likely to have a good radiator antenna on your PCB if you are using a higher frequency. So if you have a choice on the frequency, go for a lower one. And last but not least, the supply voltage. Of course, this is usually also given by the circuit. But again, if you have a chance to um, influence it, um, I would recommend to go for smaller supply voltages. Um, supply voltage or smaller sm supply voltages mean we also have smaller signal le levels, lower signal levels, which of course can cause um, less noise. And additional, the positive side effect of it is usually if you use less supply voltage, you also have less current uh, consumption.
so, so much about the choice of specification parameters for an oscillators that uh, we can use to influence um, EMC. Let's now have a look to a very special oscillator. Um, so in literature, you will find a lot of recommendations toward, towards a spec spread spectrum oscillator if you look up oscillator and EMC. Um, but this is probably only in literature because in practice, this is a solution we see very, very seldom. Spread spectrum oscillators are basically only um, probably a solution if you have no space for filter components around your oscillator or um, your design is already finished and you fail doing the EMC measurement, you don't want to change anything except of the oscillator, then you might change an um, XO, a standard oscillator with a spread spectrum oscillator. Um, but usually this wouldn't be your first choice. But anyway, um, we're going to have a quick look what a spread spectrum oscillator is and how it is working. So I have here the spectrum measurement of a CFSS2 oscillator uh, at 50 megahertz. As you can see here in the middle, um, that's the 50 megahertz. So it is basically perfectly how it should be. The resonance frequency has a very sharp and high amplitude. Um, so this is how you usually want to see a crystal or an oscillator to work. However, if you now have problems with the uh, amplitude of the 50 megahertz or with uh, the harmonics of the 50 megahertz and um, use a spread spectrum oscillator, you could put on the spread spectrum modulation and it will look like this. So here you can see, for example, a 1% spread spectrum modulation. This means that the frequency of 50 megahertz um, plus minus 1% of the frequency is modulated. So we now don't have um, the amplitude at 50 megahertz, but at plus minus 1% of 50 megahertz. So it takes down a little bit of the energy of the amplitude, and therefore this causes less problems at the EMC measurement. So much about the oscillator itself. Now let's move on and have a closer look to the noises that come from the power line. So first of all, it is pretty important or very important uh, to have a very stable and clean power line. It should have a good ground connection and it should have a low level of impedance um, over the broad frequency band. Um, yeah. To provide that and to support that, there are several measures we can take, and this is what we're now going to look at. The first recommendation I want to give is the decoupling condensator, a uh, capacitor. Um, this is usually also given in all data sheets of oscillators, and therefore it's a minimum recommendation to add a decoupling capacitor, or also ca called bypass capacitor, into your circuit. This kind of capacitor um, isolates AC from DC signals to ensure that the oscillator only sees um, a clear AC signal. And um, additional, it is an energy storage. So whenever the oscillator is um, clocking on the outside, it uh, pulls current from the, from the input. And to ensure that the energy is always uh, present and the oscillator works um, without any interruptions, in it can get the energy from the capacitor. So therefore, it ensures a stable supply voltage. And now if we choose the um, capacitor already correctly, then it can also act as a filter and uh, shunt some high frequency noises to ground um, already with the decoupling capacitor. How this um, choice is done with the decoupling capacitor, we are going to look now. The standard recommendation for most of the data sheets of oscillators is either 
10 nanofarad or 100 nanofarad. Um, however, not every 10 nanofarad capacitor is the same. Um, so here the devil is really in the detail. If we want to use a decoupling capacitor at the choice, we need to have a look at the DC bias diagram, diagram of the capacitor. So let's have a look at the DC bias diagram. This one, um, I choose three uh, 10 nanofarad capacitors and 10, uh, three 100 nanofarad capacitors um, having a little different sizes and different rated um, voltages. In general, the DC um, bias says how much capacitance is my capacitor losing with increasing voltage. Um, so yeah, with an increasing voltage, a capacitor simply can't deliver um, all of its capacitance anymore. And this is important when our capacitor should um, act as a decoupling capacitor. As said, I have chosen uh, three different kind of capacitors, each value. And now let's simply assume we do have a 3.3 os uh, volt oscillator. As we can now see here, um, two capacitors already lost a lot of their capacitance. So this one, the orange one already lost 30% of the capacitance and the brown one already 40% of their capacitance. So if we would have chosen one of these two as a decoupling capacitor, it couldn't do his work. And um, we would be a little bit lost why it's not working. If we now even look at the five volt oscillator, then we can see there are another two um, capacitors that are already decreasing in their capacitance. This is only 4% and 6%, so it still could be used. However, it's not ideal anymore. And that's why I want you to um, remember to have a check on the DC bias when you're designing in a decoupling capacitor. If we now also want to use the decoupling capacitor as a filter element, we will have to have a look in onto the impedance curves. So here we can see the same capacitors that we saw before. And again, you can see the curves are looking um, different for all kinds of the capacitors. If we now assume we do have a 20, mega, 20 megahertz oscillator, you can see it is already above the self-resonant frequency of the first capacitor. Um, during the, the phase before the self-resonant frequency, the capacitor as, act as a capacitor, and this is where we want to be. Afterwards, in that area, it is inductive, and this is not what we want to, because then it can, can't filter anymore. So uh, to have it as a filter, um, it must be on the left side of the self-resonant frequency, but also it should be low in, um, in resistance or impedance um, at the oscillator frequency. If we now assume we do have a 50 megahertz oscillator, we can see there are a, another two capacitors that wouldn't filter anything. If we now have a look at the values, we can see all the 100 nanofarad capacitors would fail to act as a filter. Um, so again, if you want your decoupling capacitor also to filter, please remember to have a look at the impedance curve, um, for example, via the Red Expert, to see if it is in the correct um, area to act as a filter. Of course, the decoupling capacitor can't filter a lot. Um, so therefore, it is recommended to add some more filtering to the power line. Um, so we are looking here for low pass filters. So it needs to pass the low frequencies and block all the high frequencies. So they don't uh, get to the oscillator and especially that they don't get to the MC measurement.
theoretically, all um, filter components we are adding at 20 dB of um, attenuation per decade. Of course, this is only a theoretically value. However, it's a good starting point if you, for example, um, have your EMC measurements uh, taken and see how much uh, attenuation you need, um, then it is for you a good idea, uh, good to get an idea of how much filter components you need to add. Ideally, for our oscillators, you get your filter to filter up to 10 harmonics. So if we stay with our example of a 50 megahertz oscillator, your filter should filter up to 500 megahertz. There are various filter topologies, um, but we only want to have a closer look to the most common one, which is the CL filter and the P filter. So let's start with the CL filter. Um, some of you may uh, mention, okay, this is already a P filter because we do have two capacitors and the inductive uh, inductance here. Um, that's true. However, uh, we will see the uh, decoupling con capacitor C1 in this case as um, an extra capacitor and only have a look at um, the CL filter. So this one is a minimum recommendation for a layout. So if you're doing a layout, it's really um, helpful if you already um, consider to add that kind of filter. Um, so if you need it, it will be already there. As we do have two filter components, it theoretically adds 40 d uh, dB attenuation per decade. Um, and here, is a simple formula. Um, however, it's only theoretically simple. In general, um, the resonance, resonance frequency of your filter should be at one tenth of the oscillator frequency. So if we now again uh, look at our 50 megahertz example, the resonance frequency of your filter should be at around five megahertz. And this is also, um, a value that we need to consider when I say the formula is only in theoretically pretty straightforward um, because the inductive uh, inductance L um, is changing with the frequency. So below the value of five megahertz, it is usually a choke that you are using and above five megahertz, it's a ferrite and not a choke anymore. Um, so that's that simply makes it a little bit difficult when calculating the inductance with that formula. Um, yeah, so uh, also a set um, with above five megahertz use a ferrite because a ferrite only starts filtering at one to two megahertz. So if you're using, for example, a 32.768 kilohertz oscillator, uh, a ferrite wouldn't do anything. It couldn't uh, filter anything because as I said, it only starts with one or two megahertz. So keep that please in mind when you are creating your CL filter. Now have a look at uh, a P filter in addition to our decoupling capacitor. This one adds in theory around 60 dB um, per decade. Um, of course, it will be less in, in a praxis. Um, however, as said, as a starting point for you to know, it's good. Um, one question that often comes here is if C2 and C3 should be the same value. And this is basically up to you. Um, if, for example, the component size of C2 and C3 is um, getting pretty big because of the um, filter frequency, uh, then you might use two different values because you don't want to have two very big components. Um, so that might be a case where you choose them differently in value. So much to the filtering on the supply input of the oscillator. Now we're going to have a look at the output line. 
Basically, this one is the most critical one with the biggest impact on the oscillator. Um, so it has the biggest influence. And um, here we definitely need to make sure that the output line um, won't get an antenna for our frequencies. Um, so here we just need to be sure, especially that it is very short and, and um, the oscillator is located close to the microcontroller. Additional, we need to ensure that the output um, waveform that comes out of the oscillator is um, keeping its properties. Um, so what uh, usually or what often comes out of an oscillator has um, undesired signals like overshooting, undershooting, ringing and echo. And these are elements that we don't want to have on our output line. Um, so here we also uh, use some measures to uh, prevent that. The first measure to do so is a serial resistance um, that is between the oscillator and microcontroller. Um, this, I would say, is also a, a high recommendation to be added as a mounting option or to be at least equipped with a zero ohm uh, resistor uh, to ensure it is there if you need it. Um, yeah, so this um, resistance already eliminates the, desire, the undesired waveform distortions. So as I mentioned before, the ringing, the undershooting, the overshooting. Um, to get to the uh, ideal value of that resistor, it is just by testing. Um, so yeah, basically just add your oscillator, look at the output uh, waveform, and um, yeah, once you have the desired waveform output, then you have the correct value for your resistor. Another option that we would recommend as a, a mounting option is the RC filter. So the RC filter is usually um, a pretty, yeah, let me see, cheap uh, filter, but it is in the most um, cases uh, sufficient enough to filter. Um, so yeah, we do have around 20 dB attenuation. So um, it's two elements of a filter, but uh, the resistor is not um, that high in quality when it comes to filter like the above mentioned or before mentioned. So there we only have like around 20 dB of attenuation. Um, the cutoff frequency for that kind of filter should be higher than the oscillator frequency. So we ensure that we don't filter out our oscillator frequency on its way to the microcontroller. Um, usually we say as a, a, thumb, a rule of thumb around five times higher than the oscillator frequency. Um, here we see uh, the formula and in did, that case, it really is uh, pretty straightforward. So um, nothing you have to consider in here. If the 20 dB attenuation doesn't be enough, um, you still have the option to use also an LC filter at the output line. However, this is not that often the case. Another uh, resistor I want to mention is the termination or also called impedance matching um, resistor. This is between the um, oscillator and ground. Um, and um, yeah, impedance matching is often a topic and it also sounds very easy theoretically that the impedance between input output just needs to match. However, the difficulties here are that the impedance is very seldom known. Like for example, with the oscillator output, you may ask your oscillator um, provider about the um, impedance. And I would say in most cases, they can't tell you the output impedance of the oscillator. And therefore it makes it difficult to make impedance matching. The good thing is that it, this one is mainly important when you're having very long traces. So if it's not possible to have a short trace between oscillator and microcontroller, then we should, um, or you should add this as a mounting option. 
Another case where you might need that termination oscillator is when your oscillator is um, is uh, powering more than one microcontroller or what, more than one user. Then it might be also uh, necessary to have impedance matching and that kind of um, resistor. And finally, let's have a quick look at a very special case. The special case that you are using the RC filter in addition to a termination um, resistor. And here you have to take care that the both resistors build a voltage divider. Um, so you must ensure that RS is very, very much smaller than RT, like 100 to 1000 times smaller to ensure uh, it doesn't, um, do not wait the um, voltage loss that is um, occurring and that your signal is still uh, good enough for the microcontroller to um, work. When we talk about EMC and EMI, there is also shielding often come on the table. And I don't want to miss out on that when it comes to oscillators. Um, so let's have a first look on the effect of the oscillator housing when we talk about shielding. Because some may think that an oscillator already comes in a metallic um, housing or enclosure, so it should already um, shield off some of the um, radiations. But I need to tell you, no, it's not the case. So if you have an oscillator, for example, with a plastic enclosure, it doesn't have any effect on shielding. If you're using an oscillator with a metal lid that is internally not connected to the crown, it will only have a very minor effect on shielding. And if you use an um, oscillator with a metal lid that is connected internally to crown, you still only have a very small effect. Um, so yeah, please just keep that in mind. The housing of the oscillator itself doesn't have any shielding effect. Of course, you may enclose the oscillator, probably together with the microcontroller in another metallic enclosure or shielding can. Um, however, that is um, yeah, more or less untypically. What is sometimes used in practice is um, an additional enclosure around an O60 or T60. So if you are looking for a very, very stable um, frequency, then um, you might want to add another closure, but that is not for EMC issues, but more to prevent um, environmental influences to get to the oscillator like wind or temperature changes. However, as said, they barely have any shielding um, measures. Now let's come to the last point of our presentation for today. Um, these are the PCB layout recommendations. First of all, let's start with some general notes that should apply to all kinds of your uh, circuit. And first and foremost, keep the traces as short as possible. Um, this is really the most important recommendation we can give you and uh, it should be um, taken care of whenever possible. Additional avoid 90 degree bends and round right angles because they could also um, have an impact on the impedance. Furthermore, do not cross any other signal lines or routes signal lines under or close by the oscillator. Again, they could um, disturb the signal, the oscillator and could add um, impedances to your system. Also, try to not get any loops like current loops in your system or keep them as short as possible. And finally, I mentioned that before, keep differential outputs, um, output traces the same length and very close to each other to avoid problems here. And finally, let's have a quick look on oscillator specific PCB layout recommendations. First of all, starting with uh, the connection of the oscillator as close as possible. I'm not getting tired to say that. 
Um, so as close as possible to the XTAL in uh, pin of the microcontroller. And in that case, leave the XTAL open, XTAL out pin open from the um, microcontroller. Additional apply best grounding practices to your oscillators. So maybe uh, you can use a wire fence uh, or cut out a crown plane under the oscillator. Then we already discussed that the decoupling a capacitor or filter, keep it as close as possible to the oscillator and ideally have at least an uh, option for your um, mounting to have a decoupling condensate capacitor and a filter capacitors um, or elements. This is something I didn't mention before, um, but is also important when it comes to the layout is adding a pull-up resistor. So oscillators usually have on their um, fourth pin, uh, for example, an enable or disable function or a standby option. If you are not using these options, please do not leave that pin open um, because um, you want to ensure that you have uh, clear switching states and you can only have that if you use a pull-up resistor on that pin. So as I said, if you're not using that function, please use a pull-up resistor. And last but not least, um, yeah, between the oscillator and the microcontroller, have at least a mounting option for a serial resistor and ideally for an RC filter. And if you are having long traces, you may also want to consider to have a termination resistor added. That's it from my side at the moment. I'm looking forward now to your questions and hope that it was interesting for you and um, helped you with some additional information. I'm also now coming back with my video. Excellent, thank you, Susanna, for presenting. We do have a few questions rolling on in. Again, if you do have any questions, simply ask them up in the little question mark box. And you can download the slides directly from this webinar uh, up in the upper right hand corner. It looks like a little file. If you click on that, you can download the slides that Susanna just presented. So going over to our first question here, you said in practice that the formula for the input filter cannot be used for megahertz oscillators. How would this person actually approach this in practice? Yeah, so in practice, I would say we, we do know the filter frequency that we are looking at. Um, so the first step will be to choose the capacitance. As said, by looking at the DC bias and also the uh, impedance curves, um, we can already choose the capacitors. And then we still can calculate the L value and use it as a starting point. Um, but I definitely have to say it is also um, up to experience. Um, so maybe also some trial and error, um, but it's not a straight, straightforward answer. I feel as though that is most questions in the electronics industry. You can do this, but there's no real set answer, especially when it comes to EMI mitigation as well, as you uh, discussed in your presentation. Uh, this next question is about the T filter. Would that be more effective for attenuation? Um, yes, a T filter is usually also very effective when it comes to attenuation. But when we are looking at oscillators, um, usually a T filter would be simply too much. And um, we would get to, uh, probably too big, too expensive parts. Um, so um, it, wouldn't it wouldn't be necessary. And on the other hand, the T-filter is more uh, capable or more recommended if you are using higher currents. With oscillators, we only have uh, milliamperes or, or milliamps usually. So uh, it doesn't necessarily need a T-filter. Uh, 
So again, in theory, yes, you could use a T filter, but in practice, it's um, not the best choice, I would say. Excellent, thank you. Uh, our next question here may have been discussed in the first few minutes, but if so, that's okay, we can cover it again. The question is, which method is advised to calculate the stray capacity of traces and pads, uh, microstrip, parallel plate, coplanar, or other? Um, so in this case, when using uh, oscillator, the stray capacitance is not of that importance, especially not when it comes to um, the, the filtering that we have been looking here. So uh, especially the topic around the stray capacitance is more important when we are looking at the usage of crystals. Excellent, thank you. Uh, our next question actually comes from a tried and true worth electronic webinar follower. Uh, have you compared all of these proposed solutions in terms of emitted disturbances and which solutions have you found that were the best? Oh, let me quickly read through the question. Sometimes it's easier if you read it instead of only he hearing it. Um, so, no, I, if I understand the question correctly, then I personally don't have, um, I will probably come back uh, to the one asking that question afterwards to discuss it in detail um, so that I make sure that I got the question correct. Absolutely. And for the questions that we don't get to today, we will be reaching out to you directly to answer those questions after the presentation. Just be on the lookout for an email in the next uh, few days. Our uh, next question here, we are kind of rounding off our uh, Q&A session, is that you addressed EMC in terms of emissions of the oscillator. What about the susceptibility of EM noise? What is the impact of noise on the power line? Uh, for example, is it advised to filter the power line of the oscillator? Um, so basically, if I understand it right, so the question is, is it, for example, advised to filter the power supply of the oscillator? Um, so I, I'm not sure if I get that right, but basically the input line um, that we discussed and the filtering of the input line, this is the, the power supply of the oscillator. Um, or maybe I get that question not, not correctly. So um, again, I'm happy to follow up with the one asking that question if I understood it correct. Uh, so please bear with me. English is not my my mother tongue, so uh, sometimes uh, the the yeah wording is not exactly how I understand it. No problem here. English is my first language, and even I have difficulties. You are doing fantastic. We're gonna <laughs> wrap things up here with our final question, and again. Everybody who has asked questions, this is a very in-depth topic. We will get to you in the next few days. Our final question is, can we use the same recommendations that you presented today with crystals? Um, no, the, the, um, the design of a crystal would be completely different because yeah, a crystal doesn't have a power supply line like we see in that case. And also there is, um, yeah, not a real output line in the terms like we had it today. So basically just the circuit around the uh, crystal looks completely different. So uh, you can't use it one-to-one -one, uh, with a crystal. So um, this, this is a, a different a topic, um, but there's also a seminar about crystals. <laughs> um, so maybe for the next time we use that topic. Absolutely. And we do have uh, some other topics on crystals specifically that we can include in the follow-up email that we will be sending out to everybody who registered for today's presentation. Susanna, thank you so much for presenting today's topic. I appreciate you um, across the pond, but in the studio. <laughs> thank you.
And thank you everybody for attending today's Worth Electronic webinar partnered with DigiKey Electronics. You're gonna wanna make sure that you apply, uh, register for next week's webinar on wireless power transfer and near field communication technology. Again, partnered with DigiKey, it's next Tuesday, 9 a.m. Central, if you are in the heartland of South Dakota, otherwise, 10 a.m. Central on the East Coast and bright and early on the West Coast. Again, if you register for our webinars, we will automatically send you the recorded presentation as well as a PDF of the slides to make it a little bit easier for you to watch later on. You can also catch our webinars on the Worth Electronic WhatsApp podcast that launches every Thursday at 6 p.m. Central. And you can find the podcast on any major podcast streaming network, including Spotify, iTunes, uh, Google Podcasts. That is the Worth Electronic What's Up podcast launching Thursdays at 6 p.m. Central. Thank you very much for joining today's Worth Electronic webinar. I'm Amelia Thompson. You can follow Worth Electronic on LinkedIn. You can also follow myself on LinkedIn to get more information about upcoming webinars and future topics. I appreciate you joining me. I'll see you soon.